So Gary, tell me a little bit about where we're sitting, what this what this building means to you, or how you know how it, how you ended up here. Well, this building, um, for whatever reason, was the place my father chose to uh, abandon me when when he got off the train down on River Road and walked straight up North Boulevard, about seven blocks. I guessed it looked inviting or welcoming, so he walked around the back and went through that door, and, and that's where he decided to leave me. Yeah. So it's a, special, it's a special place for me. It's, the book says it was uh, the luck, considered the luckiest day of my life, and it's actually the most blessed day of my life because that's the day uh, I was able to be adopted you know, eventually by the Stewart family. So. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about his, the journey on the train or, you know, from New Orleans and how he, how he got to Baton Rouge, how you got to Baton Rouge. Um, he, he had been telling my mother for a couple of weeks, couldn't have been long because I was only four weeks old when he abandoned me. Yeah. But he, he, he was telling her and warning her that he was going to take me to Baton Rouge. I believe that's because uh, Baton Rouge was just far enough away from New Orleans to where you could find an abandoned infant but never look to the nearest big city for, for the perpetrator. So he got on the train. Uh, it took about two hours to get here back in the day. And um, he left me on the, on the stairwell at about 1130. Uh, and then he returned back to New Orleans by the same train, um, and it was about 5.30 in the afternoon when Miss uh, Mary Bonnet found me. So then obviously lots of years go by, and when do you start wanting to find out who your father is? When did that you know, first kind of get in your head that you wanted to take this on? I, um, of course, after my biological mother came looking for me. Uh, the first thing I wanted to know was where was my other half. Uh, but all my life, knowing I was adopted, um, that desire to have a true identity, it, it, it bothered me, plagued me uh, all my life. But I love my parents, my mom and dad, Lloyd and Leona Stewart, so much that I would, I would never reach out and search and I, and I said I wouldn't do it until after they were gone. And uh, fortunately, I didn't have to. My, mo my biological mother found me first. I flew out the next week and met my mother for the first time. And um, I gave it one day with her before I couldn't hold the question back anymore. You know, so mom, who was my father? And, uh, you know, she sort of straightened up in her seat and took a deep breath because that's the question that, that she had been dreading. And I, you know, my heart was pumping too, I, but I needed to know. And, and she said, well, honey, I don't remember a lot because it's been so many years and I spent so many years being forced to forget everything about you and your father, my life with you and your father. I think his name was Van. Um, but all I remember, you were about three months old, and she got the time wrong. She couldn't remember. I was, I was four weeks old. Uh, I was young, uh, underage. We were on the run and in New Orleans, and one day your father said he's taking you to Baton Rouge. And he took the train, and when he came home without you, I left him immediately. And when I left him, he turned me into the authorities. And then, of course, I turned him into the authorities and told them that he had abandoned my baby. And so we were both apprehended. And I remember being driven to Baton Rouge uh, and given 10 minutes alone in a room with you uh, the last time I ever saw you. Through your research, and, and I guess tell me about the epiphany now when you were watching TV, right, is when you first made the connection with Zodiac, right? So. When my mother told me that my father had turned me into a church in Baton Rouge, she didn't say abandoned in an apartment building. Yeah. I still said, you know what? I don't think I want to know my real father. I've got the best parents in Baton Rouge and my father's the greatest dad anyone could ever have. But that only lasted for a couple of months with me. You know, the need to know just, just beat my uh, defenses to, to keep it 
quiet. So I went searching and, and my mother um, agreed to help participate and enlist some of her friends who were in the San Francisco Police Department. At the time, it didn't strike me as odd that she went to the San Francisco Police Department yeah. because her next husband, her former husband, uh, now deceased, was a retired San Francisco Police Department homicide detective. And so they gave me a name, um, date of birth, place of birth, and a social security number. And with that, I set out on what became a two-year journey to find my father. About two years later, when I had run every lead I knew how, um, came to a dead end, um, I, I, I pleaded with her to go back to her friends at the San Francisco Police Department. And they told her, the information we gave you out of Gary's father's file is all we can give you. There's information in the file that we can't share with you. And over these two years, I kept going back to her. Eventually, I found out he was deceased. And I said, I don't care what he did. He's dead now. I deserve to know. I'm his son. And she again went back to the chief of police and he said, what Gary's father did is so heinous, it would destroy you and him both. And the other officer said, what was in that file would make what his father did to you and Gary seem inconsequential. That's like giving me a reason to go look. I was going to say, so what, I mean, what must have gone through your head when you heard that? I mean, you know, I was raised in, in, a, in a wonderful Southern conservative Bible Belt family and where, you know, speeding tickets were swept under the rug. So the thought that my uh, biological parent could be a criminal uh, just, it was something I couldn't understand. It was beyond my ability to understand. So, frustrated and tired of the search, I begged her one last time, and she went with the former chief of police of the San Francisco Police Department for coffee. And she said, Earl, this is more than I can bear to see Gary in such pain. He just needs to know. And she said, Judy, tell Gary to drop it. Tell him to drop it. She called me that evening and convinced me to drop it. And I did. That was April 6, 2004. On July 31st, 2004, having dropped it, all thoughts of my father purposely pushed out from my mind. I turned on the, t the TV, flipping channels, and came across uh, an A&E cold case file with Bill Curtis at the time. And it said, this is a cold case special on the Zodiac Killer, which I didn't know anything about, about it, but I, lo I love documentaries. Um, so I settle in my chair and they flash the San Francisco Police Department wanted poster from 1969 and my heart just stopped. And I think I may have called out, maybe I let out a little yell, I don't know, but my son, Zach, was playing PlayStation or Xbox in his room. And he came running into the living room, said, Dad, what's wrong? And he sees my gaze fixed on the television. And he says, hey, Dad, it's you. And, and I said, no, it's not. I went into my office and got the only photograph that I had of my father. And the San Francisco police sergeant had told me that it was an old DMV photo. Well, it turned out it was my father's mugshot. And it was an exact match. That was the epiphany. That was the day I realized what they were saying. What your father did was so heinous, it would destroy you, running through my head. And my thoughts were, this can't be true. So I set out to disprove 
that fear. And, and it took years, but I couldn't disprove it. And everything I found validated my worst suspicions. So from that moment that you saw that, that, that moment in the living room or wherever you were watching TV, your life has not been the same since that one moment. No, my, I don't remember my life before 2002 when I first met my biological mother. 2004, it all changed. Um, I don't remember that time, but there's probably a reason. Um, I, I love my life. I love my family, my wife and son. They're everything to me. So um, I'm, I'm, I knew I had to t tell and share my story. Uh, I've been looking forward to today to, to share because it's more than a, than a whodunit, true crime, serial killer story. I am the most fortunate, blessed person you'll ever meet because what could have been and what happened. So how do you process in your head that your father is, was the Zodiac Killer? I mean, how do you work through that? How long did it take you to, to accept that? It took a long time for this to sink in. And, but over the years, having to come to terms with it, I guess I, I just got numb. Um, I'm very blessed because it's still personal to me. And my feelings about who my father was and what he did, um, there's, a personal, there's a personal tie to my father that's outside of the Zodiac Killer. And if I focus on that relationship and that relationship that I would have want, wanted to have, it keeps me from having to live in this other dark side that I've tried so hard to disassociate from. Yeah. I mean, do you worry that, I mean, that must cross your mind that, you know, part of your father is inside of you. What, you know, some of what was in his head could be in your head. I mean, do you ever worry, think about that? I, I, I get asked that a lot. And um, I guess inside of everybody, there, there are deep, deep, dark spots that we, you know, we, we don't, we're not even aware of and may live our entire lives never opening those, those closets. And, um, but there are no worries. Uh, you know, love and forgiveness overcame all in my story and, and that's how I live. And um, yeah. yeah, ask my wife, I'm a pretty normal guy. So how do you respond to critics who say, you know, a lot of people have come forward saying the Zodiac father is my, or the Zodiac killer is my father. I mean, obviously you, there's a, there's a visual, you know, connection sure. with that mugshot, but also I, I'm sure a, um, a lot of the critics would say, well, why didn't the police department, if, you know, they had his mugshot, they had, you know, all of this information, why haven't they solved it from this? When I got no further cooperation from the two police detectives in the San Francisco Police Department, one, one in internal affairs and one the, the recently retired former chief of police. I just, I did all the searching I could on the Zodiac Killer to disprove my, my suspicion. And this was back in the day of dial-up. So it took forever, and, and just as soon as I got to a decent site with information, I would get kicked off. So it took a long time, but eventually I found a page, and I think it was from ZodiacKiller.com, that said, uh, San Francisco Police Department officially closes a Zodiac case, but if any new credible leads come up, we recommend the public to contact Lieutenant John Hennessy and gave his phone number. So I contacted Lieutenant John Hennessy and shared a little of my story with him and he was extremely interested. And he asked me to summarize what we had just discussed and, and write him a letter and I did. And within a week or so, we were back on the phone. He invited me to San Francisco to visit him and, and I did. And he said he would do everything in his power to help me because he didn't want this to be true for me. Um, and, and either way, if it was, he wanted me to have closure. So um, he said, uh, let me see if I can get the file from Butler 
you know, Harold Butler worked for me for 20 something years and, and I think he ought to give me the file and let me look at it and we'll, 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 you'll feel better. And, and um, so I, I left and, and uh, a few weeks later, talked to him on the phone and I said, I'm gonna be back in San Francisco. I came back and he sat down and he said, Gary, you know, I'm really upset with Harold Butler. He worked for me for years and I went to his office and he still had your father's file, the old manual file yeah. on his desk and he wouldn't let me see it. So I did the best I could. I ran this CLETS, C-L-E-T-S, I'm not sure what that stands for, but it's a, it's a, it's a computer generated arrest and sentencing record. So I got that and I continued to research and Ultimately, he was so convinced that I was on the, on the right track that he asked for a voluntary uh, sample of my DNA. Mm -hmm. That was in 2004, and he said, be patient with me because we have a, a current backlog of about three years for current cases. So, so I go home thinking this is it, right? I think they have a Zodiac DNA profile in their folder somewhere in this Hall of Justice, they're gonna compare mine, and if they don't see any similar markings between mine and the Zodiacs, I can walk away from this forever. So, it took about a year before he voluntarily emailed me back with the CSI form that said, that instructed the crime lab director to Please analyze book reference swabs and compare to Zodiac profile. That really hit home for me. It's like, uh, you know, this, that we're really going forward. That was a year later. Sometime after that, I felt very good about the position and relationship I had with my biological mother, and, and she knew I was after this. And uh, after, uh, trying to disprove my father was a Zodiac killer. And I shared with her, well, Mom, it doesn't matter if Butler and Sanders won't cooperate. I went to the top guy in homicide, yeah. and he took my DNA. I believe when my mother saw that, I gave her that form. In, in my first draft manuscript, because I told her, this is a story I have to share. And I don't know, no way to be certain, but I believe she took that form and informed Butler and Sanders that I had gone around them. Oh, okay. Processed it? So what that? happened, yeah. the next thing that I'm aware of is the head of homicide, Lieutenant John Hennessy, has been moved out of homicide placed in a special investigations unit. My father's police record, the original old manual file that was so heinous, was destroyed. And no one at the San Francisco Police Department ever spoke to me again. Wow. To this day? To this day. So, I have opinions, but you want facts, so. Right, yeah, okay. So why, I mean, why tell the, you know, the, this process of telling the story with Susan uh, and, you know, kind of talk a little bit about just the book and, and the reaction now to the book and uh, it's kind of blowing up, right? How that all happened was I've got a, a, a dear friend, Earl Hurd, here in Baton Rouge, who's just been a mentor for me for, for all these years in, in the business I'm in. And, and he knew I was writing my story and, um, for years and he's a publisher and I said you know if nothing else I'll just self-publish this and, and we'll, we'll release it here in Baton Rouge and one day two years ago I went to his office after sitting on it for a while because I, I was exhausted with the process I went to his office and, and I said Earl can you publish my book for me you know, I, I, I'm an engineer um, I've written a lot of, of stuff in my manuscript, 
but I'm not a great writer. And right at that moment, his phone rang, and it was Susan Mustafa. Susan used to work for Earl as an editor, and Earl picked up the phone, and he says, oh boy, do I have a writer for you. This must be a sign. And I talked to Susan that very day, and Susan had published three other books, at least three other books before, and uh, she had an agent. And after I told her my story and gave her my manuscript, this, um, the summary, I think she might have walked away from our first meeting thinking, this guy's nuts. Yeah. But she did take it to the, and, and I'll let you ask her, but she took it to the beach for the weekend. She came back and said, let's do this. The reaction today, um, I believe uh, that, that I was put here for a reason. And that reason is, is so much larger than the Zodiac case. It's, it's the whole um, human interest story, the, the love, the forgiveness, the way the Stuarts raised their children. But I believe my purpose, my life's greatest purpose was to share this story with the world. The fact that it's uh, getting the reaction today uh, on, on the release date, I'm not surprised, but I am so thankful and grateful. What, and how did your dad die? Or how, your biological father? Uh, he, um, later in life, he uh, became an alcoholic. And um, his last three arrests at a minimum were for drunk driving in, in the Southern California area. Um, I found out that he actually died uh, by, he drowned in his own vomit at a bar at a hotel in Mexico City where he traveled to buy his rare books. It was his, it was all where his honeymoon started and began with my mother in that hotel. And it's where it all ended. I did find my father's grave in Mexico City, which is an unmarked lump of ground in the poorest cemetery in the poorest neighborhood of all of Mexico City. When I got there, I didn't want to look at it. And I was struggling. And and so I, I did like Lloyd and Leona taught me to do. I prayed real hard for God to give me the words to say, to give me the forgiveness that I need to have and let go of the anger. Because it, it could have been an ugly scene, but it wasn't. And the, the love and forgiveness that Lloyd and Leona Stewart taught their son, their only son, um, nurture beat out nature. And I let it go. And I told my father, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you didn't have the parents like I did, that you didn't have your own Lloyd and Leona. Because that made all the difference in my life. And I told him I forgave him for what he did to me. I, I can't extend forgiveness for anything he'd done to others but I told him I forgave him. And I told him I loved him. And I told him, although he laid me on the ground and walked away, never to see me again, that I'd never leave him alone. And that I'd come back. And I went back the second time just a couple years ago with my wife, Christy, and we brought flowers to his grave and said our goodbyes. And now I can let him go. I can abandon him. When I got there, I didn't want to look at it. 
and 